behind a wrought iron gate. We are told no arrests were made. The demonstrators were voicing anger for the president's support of Israel and refusal to back a ceasefire. Instead, the administration has been pushing for a humanitarian pause and military operations in Gaza to get aid in and hostages out. The president was asked about that yesterday. Mr. President, any progress on the humanitarian pause? Yes. President gave a yes there, thumbs up. The idea was seemingly, though, rejected by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu when Secretary of State Antony Blinken visited Tel Aviv on Friday. Israeli officials want Hamas to release the some 240 hostages first. And Blinken dismissed calls this weekend by Arab leaders for the U.S. to back an immediate ceasefire. Who we are. And I think it governs and helps govern my decisions and how I lead. Well, the majority of Americans now say they're living paycheck to paycheck. So um, a lot of folks in the same boat uh, as they try to figure out this economy. Speaker, um, we're wishing you the best and trying to keep the House running uh, and the country functioning. Thank you, sir. They have really been hit the hardest here. The problem is that that story not, is not getting out. I'll just say one last thing here. When you think of what's taking place to these citizens, and I give you a number like 341,000 dead, that's just the ones we know about. And the way the collection of uh, people killed in Mexico is taking place, it's terrible. So anyone who gives you numbers, I can tell you they are a lot higher in the number of deaths that occurred to citizens in that country. And to your point, problems uh, on a wide scale. You'll still have people arguing that this that asylum seeking is not against the law. Absolutely not. That's correct. However, illegally entering the United States is against the law, even to claim asylum. So we have mechanisms to the border. We have totally abandoned. We have mechanisms to perform worksite enforcement in the United States, to remove dangerous offenders, to find out who all these people are and what they're doing. And that's ICE. They have been dismantled by policy. So what we need to do is get back to those policies that keep people from leaving their homes. The place to secure the border is not Eagle Pass, Texas. The place to secure the, the border is through policy that stretches all the way to these countries where people realize you can spend all the money you want, you can leave your life savings behind, you can die in a jungle or die at the river, but you are not going to come in the United States unless you meet the parameters that are legally set in our immigration law. We, we allow in over a million people every year legally, but we're neglecting that. We're focusing all of our resources on illegal entry. FEMA has spent over $363 million last year alone, according to their figures, to reimburse this mechanism of releasing people into the United States, cities and non-government shelters. We are spending millions a day to take care of unaccompanied migrant children. So this is costing us in a number of ways, and we cannot sustain it for much longer. Even New York is trying to offer plane tickets to fly migrants away from their city that they once said was a sanctuary city. So the border is a complete mess. It's a mess where Michael's at. It's a, it's a mess where Jason is at. And like they all say... And it's all Joe Biden's fault. Just the human beings crossing the border. And Michael, you've said how this is... ...ties with Beijing have raised eyebrows. Just how extensive is China's reach in this region? We sat down with Andrew Thornbrook, national security correspondent for the Epoch Times for Insight. Stay with us for a full conversation after the break here on China in Focus. There's a battle for influence there in terms of the Pacific Islands between China and the U.S. What is the importance of these islands to the U.S.? In the event of conflict or even when trying to deter conflict with China, uh, the United States' ability to project power against China will fundamentally be reliant on uh, regional allies uh, in the Pacific Islands. Uh, across the whole Indo-Pacific, really, stretching from Australia and India to Japan uh, and everything in between. So these, these are really of immense importance to the United States' ability to be able to just move freely throughout the region. And speaking of that, the Solomon Islands have been making waves with their growing ties with Beijing and given their proximity to Australia. You actually have a piece out on this. Tell us how deep China's infiltration is on those islands. It's deep. Uh, you know, I, I did just indeed speak to a uh, uh, minister of parliament from the Solomon Islands, Peter Canaloria, whose uh, father was previously prime minister. He himself serves as uh, the chair of the Foreign Relations Committee there. And, uh, you, you know, it's, it's really bad uh, to hear it from him. Uh, the influence
to spread beyond just uh, you know, loans and things like this and contracts for vital infrastructure, uh, particularly 5G infrastructure, is now spreading into the culture. So China has actively sent uh, workers for many years now to essentially have Chinese workers build the Chinese infrastructure in the Solomon Islands and then uh, also marry into the local population. And so over the course of just a very short period of years, uh, we, we've seen an immense shift in public opinion towards being fairly negative towards communist China, uh, towards being more positive and more anti-U.S. That's one of the things they're dealing with now is kind of this battle of hearts and minds is, is the phrase he used uh, to try to caution people against uh, gifts from the Chinese Communist Party, as it were. And now in terms of some good news, a different island, Kiribati, is actually swinging back in favor of the West. They're also leaving China's Belt and Road Initiative. Now, last week, the U.S. and Australia announced that they'd help rebuild a wharf there. What is Kiribati's importance to the U.S.? Yeah, so Kiribati is an interesting situation. Uh, it, it's historically, you know, we've had on again, off again ties, uh, as did China. China recently looked like there was going to be a warming there in 2019, around the same time they pushed into the Solomon Islands. Uh, but now I think Kiribati's turn away from Beijing, uh, it's not as firm as we would like, but it, it's beginning to turn away from Beijing, as many nations throughout the world do kind of shun the Belt and Road Initiative, having realized that China doesn't really have the money it says it has to invest freely. It also has a lot of strings attached in terms of wanting security agreements with the nations it does business with, you know, the ability to station security troops there, which we now know from ports like those in Greece and uh, elsewhere, that those are actually actively used by the regime throughout the world to collect intelligence. Uh, so I think it's just uh, been, in the last few years, a real awakening to just how pervasive uh, the threat from the Chinese Communist Party is and how they use even just the smallest presence in a, in a nation like Kiribati to really uh, negatively impact the local population to their own benefit. Mm. It seems part of the greater concern here is not just an invasion of Taiwan but by Beijing, but the influence or presence of China getting closer to the continental U.S. How do you see these island nations playing out in that kind of battle of influence? Yeah, so I think right now we, we have to really struggle to not simply view the islands as a point of influence between the United States and China. And this is why I talked to uh, Mr. Kilnori about uh, uh, quite a bit off the record uh, both on and off the record, is just this idea that these smaller nations have a lot to gain from both China and the United States in terms of the economy. And both the United States and China very much want to be able to leverage their alliances and want to be able to leverage uh, the geography of those locations to their advantage in competition with one another. But if the United States is going to have a lasting presence and a lasting relationship with these nations, we need to push beyond just viewing them as sort of a uh, means to demand with our competition with China and really try to invest in them uh, the way that they want to be invested in. I think that's one of the silver linings of this mammoth uh, national security supplemental we've seen for the Biden administration, right? It's that it offers $2 billion uh, to create new lending programs uh, internationally that would essentially give alternatives to these smaller nations like Kiribati, uh, <laughs> they don't have to borrow from these incredibly predatory lending schemes from China. And so I, I think that's some that's an area where we could do better, uh, but we are definitely trying to make strides there. And how much of that comes down to diplomacy in terms of dealing with the people of these nations? A lot of it. You know, I think if, if there's any critique we might have the United States approach as far as that, it's been incredibly heavy on the military uh, side And the fact is we need a lot more diplomacy, a lot more intelligence sharing, perhaps a lot more economic cooperation. You know, these, these nations are going to be won over in the long term by the system that they feel they'll be best represented by and treated most fairly by. Uh, right now, we're seeing the U.S. gain the upper hand because they're seeing that China is promoting an unfair system, promoting debt trap diplomacy, they're, you know, promoting these underhanded means of getting security agreements uh, into various contracts. The United States just needs to 
show up and allow these countries to behave the way that they want to behave within the norms and the rules of the international order, and I think that'll win the day. Andrew Thornton. What? Which is essentially their master plan for humanity, the agenda for the 21st century. And this 100-year-long agenda of theirs is broken down into shorter 15-year-long segments. The first 15-year plan was called Agenda 2015, or the Millennium Development Goals. And then currently, we are living in the second 15-year plan, <coughs> the so-called Agenda 2030, which, at least according to UN documents, is the agenda to transform our world for quote-unquote sustainable development. And unbeknownst to many, many people, for the past 10 or so odd years now, this broad agenda from the United Nations has been trickling down, getting implemented as concrete policies right here in America. And so using things like the Endangered Species Act, WOTUS, the Waters of the U.S. Act, the Antiquities Act, as well as quite literally billions of dollars of federal money to either buy up land or to convince landowners to place conservation easements <coughs> on their land, so it's technically still private, but you're just not allowed to develop it, using all these different methods, the government has been taking land out of production in order to supposedly, well, save the planet. This is all part of the Biden administration's broad plan to place 30% of America's land and put it completely out of production by the year 2030. This would mean that 30% of the land would be placed into federal conservation and it would essentially be idle. There would be no grazing, there would be no farming, no drilling, there would be no fishing, no developing, basically just no human involvement. And while the current aim is to take 30% of America's land by <coughs> the year 2030, once that's actually achieved, well, the next step will be to take 50% of America's land by the year 2050. It's sort of a rolling project with the ultimate goal being for the federal government to own a majority of the land in America and to make that land inaccessible to the people in order to, again, save the planet. And while the people who live in the cities, in the urban centers, they don't really feel the effects of these policies. When the people that live in the cities start going hungry, then it will affect them. Because there's no food being grown in America anymore. Because they don't want it. <laughs> Take your land and put solar panels and wind farms in. Be distributed among the people so they can always control their government. Right now, things have uh, tripled as far as cost. I bet you're going to see across the board higher food prices. Is anybody even held accountable for screwing up? No. Because every communist tyrant of the last hundred years has understood if you control the food, you control the people. Everything is falling apart. You have to understand the shortage of food. We're heading for a world food crisis, as we hear all the time. Do you see any hope for the situation? Yeah, we have to continue fighting for it. No farmers, no food. They will 